Hello and welcome to another episode of a very good social media podcast where we try to live up to that name every day. I'm your host, Zach Galia. Let's get into it. So today's episode uh, is one I've been looking forward to for a long time. A guy who I've followed on LinkedIn for even longer um, and learned a lot from, but uh, Jacob Shipley, who's the head of social with uh, Benzinga, just someone who, if you've been on LinkedIn, you follow social media people, his name generally pops up. Um, and it's it's always great advice. It's always great insight. And it was just great to be able to sit down and talk to him about, you know, how he got into the industry, you know, the challenges that he faced along the way. And and honestly, just learn from him, you know, whether that's developing strategy or, or how do you grow a brand, um, you know, from from nothing to something and, and how do you activate with your followers and, and how do you provide value for your brand and, and the people who, you know, you're trying to target his customers. So a lot of great stuff in this episode. I can't wait for y'all to listen, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jacob to the show. Awesome, dude. Thanks for having me, bro. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's, it's funny, like being able to finally sit down and talk to, you know, people who I've, I've basically just met on LinkedIn and like followed for so long and like always looked to you, looked to a couple others on, on the platform for advice and, um, you know, about just anything and everything. So it's always nice to, to put a face to the name and, and get a time to chat. Yeah, totally. And it blows my mind to hear that because you're definitely one of the people that I've always like looked at on LinkedIn. I'm like, man, that guy knows what he's doing. And so, uh, yeah, dude, I love it. Well, at least I'm uh, I'm putting on a good face at least because I, I don't know if anyone knows everything what they're doing. But um, well, cool. Well, honestly, the the first thing I like to get into is just your journey, how you got to where you are, as as far as you want to take it back, and um, and then kind of going over what you're up to today and and uh, and and how it all kind of came to be. Yeah, sure. I I went to college at the University of Missouri. Uh, they're known for their journalism school, so I was at the journalism school pretty quickly realized like there's not a whole lot of money to be made in traditional journalism. So I studied advertising in the journalism school. And then when I graduated, I did some marketing communication stuff for the ag school. And that was an incredible job. Absolutely loved it. Working with like just cool people doing cool stuff and uh, had a blast. And my wife was still in college when we got married. And so we knew we didn't want to stay in Columbia. Uh, it was an awesome place to go to college, but not, I mean, we just wanted something new. You know, we were like 21, 22, just married. We're like, let's get out of here. Let's go do something. And so I applied for like, I mean, no exaggeration. I think it was 197 jobs just across the board, just like trying to like throw a bunch of dice and see where it landed. And I, over the course of like eight days, we had four interviews. And so we flew all over doing those interviews. And the one that stuck was in Oklahoma City, doing social media for Uversion, which is the Bible app. And it's owned by a local church based out of Edmond, Oklahoma, right outside Oklahoma City. And so I was their first social media hire. They'd had social media accounts, but nobody like just dedicated to Uversion's social presence. And honestly, like I had no business even reading the job description, was wildly unqualified. Uh, But they brought me down, they interviewed me, and then we just like the cultural fit was there. And they really believe like we can teach people skills, but we just want people that are like on board with the mission. And so I spent two and a half years there uh, really just learning from absolutely incredible people doing incredible stuff in the social media world. And I think that really framed how I think about social just because it was, I mean, we were part of a church and we're, it was a nonprofit app that just gives everything away for free. And so we were all about just like providing value we never sold anything. We never tried to get people. I mean, we did like fundraising stuff sometimes, but it was very like, it was just, how can we just add value and make our followers' lives better? And so that was our only goal. And so for two and a half years, that's all I thought about. It was like, how can we make our followers' lives better? And so as a result, our audience grew pretty quick. And uh, my wife and I got pregnant and we quickly decided we'd really like to live near free babysitters. And so her parents had retired to Northwest Arkansas So I started applying for jobs in Northwest Arkansas area, landed a job with Tyson Foods. And I mean, nothing but great things to say about the, you know, my team was incredible. Um, I think it was was a bit of a culture shift going from, you know, you version, it was like, you have an idea in the morning and it's live by lunch. You know, it was just very, very fast paced, small team, startup kind of feel, very innovative. 
And then Tyson's obviously like a Fortune 100 company. And so just different pace, um, different processes that I wasn't used to, learned a ton. Uh, and then as of about eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, I took a role of head of social at Benzinga, which is a financial media company based out of Detroit. And so uh, I'm working on the social, uh, overall social strategy, vision for social media, and helping you know the channel owners kind of uh, execute day to day. That's awesome, man. Well, and so many different things resonate with me in the, in that story. One being that free babysitters, I I feel that in my soul. <laughs> um, but uh, but basically, like when you're talking about you know applying for hundreds of jobs, like I remember going through that process. Like it was, um, I mean, first trying to get into the industry, and then once I had my job in NASCAR way back when, it was like. I finally got my feet kind of underneath me and it was like, this is what I want to do. But then it was like, all right, now what? And I remember just application after application and interviews at different places. And it just was like, I had no necessarily idea where the next step was, but I was like, I was always looking and it was, it was so like, not daunting, but just difficult knowing like you want to take that next step, but you didn't really know what that next step was. Yeah, totally. It's 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 so interesting. And for, like when I when I was leaving Mizzou, where I was working and went to school, I really wanted to get out of like I had been so pigeonholed into like video production. I I paid for college by filming wedding videos. So me and my college roommate did that, and then my wife and I kept it going right when we got married, and that was my you know first job. And so, but I felt like man, if I don't like do something different, I'm just going to be the video guy, and I don't want that. And so then I was you know kind of applied for jobs all across the board and landed in social. But yeah, there's totally, there's some of that's like, I, don't know, I feel like it just like works out, you know, it's like you, you feel like I don't know what's next or I don't know where to go. It's just like, I don't know. I'm, I'm just like faith is super important to me. So I believe like in a higher power and it's like that, just like, it just all kind of like, I don't know, like it, it, it works out better than I could ever plan it. You know, dude, I, I couldn't agree more that that's always something like my dad always taught me, like something that I've always lived by is just like, what's meant to be will be. But when you're looking deeper into the process, like it's, I mean, you know, relying on your faith and and that's a key for us too, but like, it's scary. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like thinking, okay, I think I've learned all that I can in this role. I'm ready for what's next, but I literally have no idea yeah. what's next or where that's going to lead me or what the role is. And it's like, you almost just have to take that leap of faith and and just see what happens. Totally. Yeah. And like the timing, you don't know like how long it's going to take or what the process is going to be. Um, and yeah, I, like I have a, a, a LinkedIn post that's done pretty well for me that I posted a few times. It was like during that process when I was applying for jobs all over, there was a job in Wichita. So my wife and I drove to Wichita and it was a senior living facility. It was like a, a company that owned a bunch of senior living facilities and it was doing video stuff for them. And I asked, I was like, so what's it like, you know, living in Wichita? And the guy said, well, we're seven hours from Denver. And I was <laughs> like, okay. I do not want to live in Wichita. That's like the best and no, no shame on Wichita, but it's just like part of that. I was like, you just don't know anything, you know? And so it's like, I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't, and we moved to Oklahoma city without knowing anybody without knowing, you know, no friends, no family, but there's part of that. that's just like, that's what makes it fun too. Is like, you just, you figure it out, you know? That's true, man. That That's like, well, one, that dude did not sell which yeah. <laughs> too hard. That's for sure. But, but yeah, I mean, that, that was like, you know, whenever I got the opportunity to go out and interview with the Arizona Cardinals, it was like, literally had never been to Arizona. I don't think I'd been further West than like St. Louis, maybe, or probably a little bit with the Steelers for, you know, a hot second here and there. But like, it was like coming off the plane. It was like, Oh man, there's mountains out here. Like, yeah. this is like, I thought this was a desert. And, and so it's like, it was that shock. But again, like you said, that was so exciting. It was like, my wife and I were literally packing up the car. We're going to move 36 hours away and, and see what happens. And it was such an amazing experience and so glad I did it. But it's like, it, it just goes back. Like it, it's terrifying to think like when you break that down of just like, yeah, we're going to, you know, give up everything, throw everything in the car and move across the country. It's like, how do you do that aside from if you, if you've got faith that everything's going to work out? Totally. And you know, now it's like, I've got three daughters. And so it's like every decision I make has such a big implication for my family. But it was like back then 
my wife was still in school. And so it was like, we were so poor, the cockroaches were moving out, you know, it was like, we didn't have anything. And so it was like, we had nothing to lose, you know, and it's easy to glorify that, you know, and like looking back and it was like, man, that was, it was tough sometimes, but it's like, I don't know. That's all like, you know, the, the figuring it out is what makes like, you know, it was what makes it fun. It's true. Well, and, and another thing you said uh, about kind of that culture shock or, or just having a different pace of processes and things like that, when you went from you version to Tyson foods, like I remember that going from NASCAR to the Steelers where it was like my department of four people within NASCAR, I think we handled like six departments worth of stuff. And then going to the Steelers, it was like, oh no, we have like 12 people that do each of those things. And it was like, like you said, it, it was, it was a shock in a very good way where it was like, it taught me so much about how to go through these processes and approvals totally. and different things like that, where, you know, when I was with NASCAR, it was like, it was me, like, you know, we had a couple yeah. different approvals and stuff like that. But for the most part, it was just like, like you said, you think of an idea in the morning and it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's out by the evening. Yeah. Which it is like, I, at Benzinga, there've been a couple of times where I've been asked like, Hey, can you make, uh, can you like pitch this idea or like, can you like come up? And I know how to do that now because of my time at Tyson foods, where it's like you version was like, Hey boss, I think I have an idea. All right, ship it. You know? <laughs> and so like, I, I didn't, that was so fun and we grew so fast, but I didn't flex that muscle of like learning how to showcase the ROI, what we were doing. You know, there, there's so much that I wasn't learning. And so like wouldn't trade my time at either of those places for anything just because they taught me wildly different skills. Yeah. And, and you learn so quickly, like analytics, when I first started, it was just like those, it was like the bane of my existence because everyone was always like, what's this number? What's this number? And it's like, well, yeah, it's not about the number exactly. Like there's so many other things that go into this. So it was like, you're not necessarily analytics, uh, like averse it early on, but it was like, it was something that I wasn't using to my advantage enough. And so like, as I continue to grow and, and learn in the industry, it's like, those numbers work to your advantage. Like you want to be able to tell those stories to show that ROI, to show the impact that this stuff has to those people who think num like numerically rather than just like, oh, this video was really cool. So it's like you trying to not necessarily justify the content that you're producing, but like making it kind of globally understood that it was either a success or a failure or somewhere in between. Yeah. I mean, you version was like, our content was, you know, like we were the Bible app. So our content was like pretty fixed, right? We're going to pull from, we open the book, we copy and paste from the book and we post it, you know, there wasn't a lot that was changing. And so, um, but yeah, I think, I think that was more of like, I was, I was a team of one essentially like doing just social stuff, but there was no, it was, you know, like there was no like, why are we going to post it? Well, it was like, well, because we think it'll make our followers lives better. Whereas then, you know, transition to a Fortune 100 company, it's like, what's the ROI of this post? How much time and money does it take to produce? And then how much is that going to make us? And it's like, I have never thought about that before, you know? And so working through that of like spending two and a half years at Tyson trying to get up to speed on how can I tell stories about the content and the results. And I think that's probably for anybody that's like wanting to go from like an individual contributor level to a leadership level. And you, I mean, you probably know this like super well too. It's like, I, I feel like the ability to communicate about what you're doing rather than actually what you're doing, you know, like it, it's not just creating the content and posting the content, the ability to pitch to leadership, pitch to um, other people looking in and explain what you're doing and why it matters. That for me is what's been most like monumental and like moving in my career. When, and you bring up a good point. That's not really like that's not in the handbook of like, here's what no. you need to know from social. It's like, you're, you're kind of trained of just always be on social, always see what's happening. Think of good ideas, put them out. Everyone's happy. But if there's so much more to that of like, like you said, in a leadership role, you're trying to not only kind of steer the ship, but also make sure that your team understands what the bigger goals are and, and communicating from, you know, your leadership, what those goals are and how we're going to achieve them. And then vice versa, once, you know, your team has kind of the goals in mind and understands it's like, then it's how do we relay this goofy TikTok video to, you know, the president of our company to make them understand that like, well, no, this isn't just 
you know, funny stuff, this is helping us achieve that bigger goal. And it's like, that's something that, you know, it took me a while to learn too, but it's like, that's such an, like a, a, not a slept on piece of it, but just something that doesn't get talked about a lot. Yeah, for sure. Like, honestly, I, I, you know, kind of talked about like how you just like, it just works out, you know, like I had no idea what the role at Tyson was going to be. And it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And it taught me something like that, like wildly different um, just because of the culture there is like, there was a lot of like pitching and explaining, which like, I didn't expect that at all, but because of that. Yeah. So I feel like even then it wasn't like, I didn't have a master plan If I'm going to go to Tyson foods and learn how to pitch. And so that I can position myself well for leadership roles. It was just like, that's where I found myself and I happened to figure that piece out. So yeah, it, it, it's funny how that stuff works out. For sure. Well, yeah. And I mean, and, and two qualities, like everyone always asks, like anytime I'm hiring or anyone who hits me up for advice and stuff, it's like, what, what are, you know, the most important qualities that, you know, not necessarily that I look for, but most important qualities to have in this industry. And like two of the ones I always bring up are organization and communication. And it's like, that's definitely not the first thing that would come to mind yeah. when it's like, you're looking for a social, uh, a social spot, but it's like, it's so important. Like if you could have the greatest ideas in the world, but if no one knows that they're happening or why they're happening or how they help achieve the goals, or, you know, just the fact that how do you organize all of these thoughts into a way that then you can pitch to someone or organize these thoughts or this goofy idea into a way that then you can work with others in your team to make these things happen. And then putting together your content calendar and what platforms they're hitting and what lengths and sizes and all this stuff. Like there's so much that goes into it that, I mean, even to this day, like I'll, I'll talk to, you know, older family members or things like, and it's like, well, what do you do? It's like, why well, I, I do social media. I'm like, Oh, well that, that must be pretty cool. Like pretty easy. Yeah. And it's like, well, not exactly yeah. cool. Yes. Easy. Yeah. I mean, nah. you scroll Twitter all day, right? Yeah. Right. For sure. And I mean, like people always think working in social media is so sexy. And it, I mean, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I love, you know, doing what I do and I'm in financial media now, which is like totally new for me. And like you, especially like people think working in social is sexy, working in sports social is like, that's like the end all be all. And so people think, oh yeah, you must be yeah, buddy, buddy with all the players, living the life, you know, and it's like, you know, the organization and communication is not like the sexy side of it. But yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like, that's the stuff that like, separates like, good social media from, you know, phenomenal. Yeah, that, that's I always tell like anyone who asks, is, I, I like I always say, well, I, I work for the team, I don't actually play for the team. So right. there's, <laughs> there's a little bit of a difference. But but no, I mean, it it's always good to kind of take a step back. And like, you know, I've talked about this before, in, in a couple different episodes, but it's like, you, you get so stuck in the weeds, and you know, all the different things that you have to do, and, and all the insanity sometimes of, of going through different things. And, you know, and then you lift your head up and look out your window and it's like, Oh, you're at the ballpark. You're at, you know, this NFL stadium. Like yeah. it, it's, there are definitely worse things you could be doing. And, totally. and you know, I, I grant at this point, I don't know what I would be doing aside from that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is the thing too, is like, we have like our skills are like probably some of the least transferable, you know, of like, well, I'm really good at growing organic social media accounts. It's like, well, what else is that? Like, well, you know, that that's about it, you know? <laughs> That's a, like, I, I swear I've had a conversation a couple of times, but it's like, if you were doing, if you had a different job than what you're currently doing, what would it be? And I'm like, I have, I have no idea. I have no yeah. idea because it's like you, it just, like you said, like you have faith, it kind of all happens and it falls into place. Like I, like I graduated college in 2011, like social media was not a career back then. And it's like somehow I ended up where I am and somehow I learned all of these things yeah. along the way. And it's like, it, it's just so crazy to see kind of how the the industry has kind of evolved in, in, I mean, just even the last 10 years. Yeah, totally. I mean, Luke Combs has that song, uh, you know, not to quote a country singer, but he has that song uh, doing this where it's like, I'd still be doing this if I wasn't doing this, you know, of like, you know, I just, you, this is the only thing I'm good at, you know? Yeah, dude, it's crazy. Well, hey, let me, uh, we've kind of been talking about it anyway, but like for those, you know, college students, those kids who are still just trying to figure it out, like they, they kind of know what path they're on, but they're not entirely sure where that's headed. You know, what, what advice would you have for them? And, and kind of like maybe something that you wish, you know, looking back, you know, hop in the DeLorean and, and give yourself some advice back in those days of like, 
how do you get through, you know, the times where you're applying for, you know, 200 plus jobs at a time and not sure what the next step is? Yeah, for sure. I think part of it is just like, you know, the there's that quote that's like, you know, the man who loves walking will walk further than the man who loves the destination of like, if you can fall in love with the process of like getting better, then it's like the results become irrelevant. Um, and so I think that's, that's a huge part of it. And I think too, for like, for getting a job in social, I, I was very, lucky that you version took a chance on a kid fresh out of school and gave me a job that I had no business doing. I think most of the time you have to have some sort of body of work that you can point to. And so working at Uversion kind of gave me that. And then while I was at Uversion, I was took what I learned and I started trying on like some personal accounts, like just starting accounts for me, it was on Instagram. I was living in Oklahoma city. So I started an account called our OKC where I just started posting about Oklahoma city, cool people, cool creators, and started growing those accounts. And over time, that grew to be pretty significant. And then I grew another one about Kansas City, which is where I'm from. And so I just started growing those accounts. And then over time, you just accumulate this body of work that you can point to and say, I did that. That's this, you know, this irrefutable proof that you know how to build an audience, right? And there, there are so many different things about, you know, different platforms, different industries. There's so many variables, but at least like you understand the core of like, how to get people to come and listen to your account. And so I think for somebody that's just like applying for jobs is in between applying for jobs, just create an account where you just try to like make somebody's life better and then um, grow a following where you can point to that and say, this is what I can do. And I think that's, you know, that's a better seller than any resume. That's so true. I like that. That's such a great point is just, there are so many opportunities out there where, financial gain is not really the end goal. I mean, it, granted, like I'm well aged in this industry at this point, but like this podcast is a great example. I am, it, it's basically just a hobby making $0 from it, yeah. but just something that's like, if an employer's ever looking for someone who's hungry or understands the industry or can at least hold a conversation for an hour about the industry, like this is a great example of that. Like it's, it's not anything that's necessarily benefiting me now, aside from being able to, you know, reach out and talk to people like you and learn from you and your journey and your advice. But like, it's stuff like this that makes our industry so great where it's like, I, just do stuff. Like you said, like great totally. advice, great advice is just keep going. Like there's so many opportunities where, you know, like you said, create an account. Like if you're, if you think, you know, this next opportunity that you want is going to be steeped in TikTok and, and editing and understanding, make a TikTok account and figure out yeah. how to do that. It's like they're, they're, you know, on the job training without actually needing the job to do it. Yeah, totally. And I think for me too, there's like, when I was at Uversion, I was, um, I started toying around with LinkedIn and started picking up some like freelance opportunities. And that was, that's like the golden ticket. If you can get to where you can get paid to learn on like accounts in other industries and other areas. And, you know, obviously you want to be able to drive results for them, but that, that was huge for me too, was like, if you've grown one account, that's awesome. But if you can point to 12 accounts and you say, I've had a hand in all of those, that becomes, you know, all things equal, an employer or a freelance candidate is going to go with the, you know, the person that's got the wider, deeper experience. And I mean, like diversifying kind of the industries that you're into yeah. where it's like, I mean, for me, like it's been sports for the longest time. So it's like, if I were to ever look outside of sports, I think there's probably a lot of proving that I could do that. That would make sense. But if you're, like you said, if, if you're looking at, you know, trying to create these accounts or finding freelance work and, and kind of spreading your wings and tackling a bunch of different industries and showing like, well, no, like just because I did this on, you know, sports account X, I can also do it for, you know, this brand who specializes in, you know, scooters or yeah. this brand who does that. And it's like, it shows that your skill set and your knowledge base is so varied and transferable that it's, it, like you said, it's more attractive to, to anyone who's looking for, for someone like that. Yeah. And I think if you can tell that story too, of you can build an audience, you can create, find out what the audience wants, create content that draws them and engages them. 
I don't want to say it becomes plug and play because that makes it sound easy and it's not easy, but it is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple in the sense that like you figure out what the audience wants and then you give that to them. Right. And that's obviously a very, very like complex thing, but then that does translate, you know, between industries. And if you can do that a few times and tell that story of like, I understand the process that will apply to this industry. Your industry is not, you probably think it's super unique, but it, it's not so unique that it defies the laws of human nature, right? We give people content that encourages them, entertains them, inspires them, and it will grow an audience over time if we, you know, invest in that for the long haul. When, and, and we've kind of talked about like the creating of content, the understanding of how it performed and, you know, continuing that journey. But you bring up a great point too, is like the initial stage is, listening and understanding and knowing like this is something that you know i dealt with going to the steelers it was like i was a steelers fan my whole life but i didn't necessarily understand from a content perspective what fans were looking for so it was like i almost had to reintroduce myself to my own fandom to understand how do you create content for the people who are looking for this? Then going to the Cardinals where I didn't know anything about the Cardinals and understanding that just because I produce content for another football team doesn't mean that that content works yeah. in the desert. So it was like trying to learn and understand and then coming back here to Pittsburgh, like obviously been a Pirates fan all my life. But like, again, knowing that, you know, I've created content for NFL franchises for the last seven years, it was a big swing trying to then move and figure out, okay, well, I understand content. Like we were talking about, like, I understand content. I understand the framework. I understand what we're trying to accomplish, but like, how do we do this? That speaks to Pittsburgh baseball fans instead of Pittsburgh football fans, Arizona football fans, Michigan NASCAR fans, like the listening side of things is so, so important that it just like none of the other stuff can happen until the understanding of who you're talking to makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. When I was at Tyson, the division I was working in was like food service. So selling into like school cafeterias, restaurants, you know, so like when you think about like your mom and pop like restaurant, well, they're buying from a distributor, but that distributor is like buying their food from, you know, all these big companies like Tyson and, you know, all those. And so how do we sell into that? And so like my end customer was like kind of the vision I created of him was like, He's got tattoos, probably like an ear piercing, lip piercing, and he's smoking a cigarette by a dumpster on his smoke break at 11 p.m. before he closes up the kitchen, right? Like, I've never been that person, you know, but I need to understand that person if I'm going to create content that resonates and, you know, ultimately, like ladder back up to ROI. If it's going to produce ROI, it has to be valuable to the audience. So I need to understand. And so like, yeah, the, I think that's talking about like skills, organization, communication, but also the ability to to understand people that you're not, like people that are in a different industry, different profession, who have different interests, and the ability to understand like what what do they want, what do they hate, like what makes them. I was talking to Ish Verdusco, who's the social leader at A16Z Crypto, and he was telling me that when he started, he interviewed everybody on the team. It was like 90 people, and he asked him like, if A16Z Crypto was a person. What would they say? How would they talk? What emojis would they use? What would be what would be cringe? Like what would like what would they not say? And so if you can go through that exercise and like really understand the brand and the customer, that's like, yeah, you're you're 90% of the way there. Well, and you bring up a great point too, is like not only understanding the customer that you're speaking to, but also understanding the brand that you're working for and the voice that you need to create to connect to, you know, the fans and the consumers. And it, it, there's, I could go on about this all day, but like it, it's so, there's so much thinking and so much understanding and learning that has to take place before you can just be like, all right, well, let's make this video series and it'll be fine. Everything will work out. It's like, well, there's so much more to it than that. Yeah. And when you talk to you about like the difference between like a content creator and like a social media professional, like leader, I think, you know, it's like, I just want to create dope memes. Well, that's awesome. And that can really grow a following and that can create a really, really engaged community. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can make a great living doing that, but to lead a social team for a brand, like you have to be able to go beyond just like, oh, this is funny. This is cool. And like, you have to meld those two worlds of the audience, but then yeah, the brand side of how how can you stay true to, you know, for better, or for worse, like there's a leadership team that thinks we should be sounding and talking a certain way. And so how can you mesh those together to 
to make something really exciting happen for the audience. Well, and, and I always say like the two pieces for, for content are it's, it's the sizzle and it's the substance. So it's like, you have those memes, you have those things that catch people's attention that, you know, grow the following that really like yeah. make you a bigger part of kind of the global conversation. But once people are where you are and have found you and follow you, there has to be something more than just this shock value, fun, yeah. goofy stuff. Like there has to be some substance of like, okay, they have my attention, but like, why do I care now? Right. And so that's again, like that, that fine line and fine balance of like gaining attention and gaining that notoriety, but then holding that audience and making sure that it's just, you know, they're not just looking for these memes and this shock value. It's like, there's so much more to it. Yeah, totally. I couldn't agree more. Like the, it's funny how like I feel like every social media pro has like their own terminology or analogies, but it's like we're all saying the same thing. I always say like you're either building an audience or you're converting an audience. Those are the two buckets. Like we're, we're grow, creating content to like attract attention or creating content that helps people go deeper uh, in you know our brand's ecosystem. So yeah, totally, totally agree. That, that's been another great thing about this podcast is like learning everybody, like we, just like you said, literally we're all saying the same thing yeah. <laughs> in different rooms at the same time, but like yeah. the, the terminology that everyone uses is awesome. All right. So we've talked a lot about kind of like learning, understanding, developing, organizing, all that good stuff. Now I, I kind of just want to go into a little bit more of just how, how do you develop a successful strategy because I, I mean and i say successful because there's a lot of different variations that are are involved with that but like when you're kind of sitting down and, and you're developing whether it's for you know earlier in your career whether it's freelance stuff whatever it might be like when you are are sitting down to put together this strategy of of how you think something would work just take take us through that and, and any advice that you'd have for someone who's maybe going through that the first time yeah that's great i think i mean obviously like the cop out answer is like, well, it depends, you know, but it does depend obviously on a lot of variables of like size of the team, size of the brand. But I think like I wrote a post a while back called like, I, I dubbed it like the minimum viable social strategy. And so kind of like boiled down is like, there are a finite different like number of types of content. You've got platforms that prioritize text-based content platforms that prioritize less and less so like image-based content, but now it's more like short form content. And then YouTube is obviously like, you know, long form content and lots of podcasts in there. And so picking, when most people hear that, they, they start to think my brand probably fits in this bucket or that bucket. Are you sitting on loads and loads of blogs? Are you, or does your CEO have a podcast that's got like just a treasure trove of video content? I'm trying to figure out like, what content do you have? What content can you sustainably create? If your you know, company has no video camera, no audio equipment, and no budget, okay, well, then building out like a really, really successful YouTube strategy, not saying it's impossible. I mean, you can do incredible things with an iPhone, but it's, is there an easier route that can get you more traction more quickly? And you used, you know, air quotes for uh, successful. I think the way I'd hit that is, I always say like, you can't sell to an audience that you don't have. So if you don't have an audience, you're definitely not going to sell. If you do have an audience, you still might not sell, but at least you can because you have people to sell to. So I, I mean, I say successful is like, can you grow a following of people that want to hear what you have to say? You have to be able to pitch them and have a product that they want to buy or, you know, a service or, you know, that, that doesn't completely solve the problem. But, you know, life is easier on social when you have a big audience. And so, yeah, so picking what is a... Um, a platform and then picking like, I think I called it like your ride or die platform. So like, is it everything I'm going to, you know, live and die by Instagram, you know, TikTok or what's your, even if you create short form video, there's a difference between short form video that's optimized for YouTube shorts versus reels, even Instagram reels versus Facebook reels versus YouTube shorts. So what's your ride or die platform? This is a platform that you are going like all in on for me, like my personal brand is like LinkedIn. That's like, I'm optimizing everything for LinkedIn. Um, now I cross post a lot of that to Twitter. And so that's like that next step of like, you're creating content. I say it's like a sustainable volume of content. People say like, how much content should I create as much as you possibly can for a long period of time? Like don't do 10 posts a day and then fizzle out for three days. Like, but you also don't want to do once a month, you know, like you need to be like a high volume that is sustainable. And then, so use that type of content 
let's say it's like LinkedIn. So you're posting on LinkedIn. Um, that's your ride or die. You're optimizing for that. But then are there other places you can put it? Like, yeah, you can copy and paste and put it on Twitter. You can put it on Facebook. You could do some automation and put it on an image and post it to Instagram. You could do like a, a background and create a reel out of it. Is that going to be the best performing Instagram reel or YouTube short possible? No, but at least you're putting out content there from the content you already have. And so that's what it's like minimum viable strategy. That's like if I was working for a small company, limited budget and said like, go do social. That That's kind of how I'd start thinking about it. Uh, there, oh man, so so much in there again. I, I so much appreciate it. Um, I love like you can't sell to an audience you don't have. That's totally. that makes so much sense. But yeah, I mean, like I, I just had a conversation the other day with with someone overseas who manages. You know, I you know I think it's a basketball team, but like it, it's very much like the focus was very much on limitations and things that couldn't be done and things that you know, weren't happening. And it's like something that I always preach is like, instead of focusing on what you can't do, focus on what you can do and try and be the best that you can be at that, you know, like use, use your limitations almost as opportunities to showcase yeah. your superpower, whatever that might be. And it, it kind of goes into what you were saying. Yeah. The, the senior pastor of Life Church, the church where I worked and attend now is Chris and Craig Rochelle. And he has this quote, he says, uh, growth creates complexity, complexity kills growth. And I just love that because it's like the bigger you get, the bigger the team gets, the more complex it gets. And then it, you notice everything kind of slows down. And so from then, it's just a fight to like get back to like the volume and the pace that you once were. Um, and he also has a phrase that I love. He says, like, think inside the box. He said, whenever somebody says like, think outside the box. The next thing they say is like stupid on steroids. You know, it's like, okay, like let's come back in. It's like, based on the box you're in, the constraints that you have, what can you do with what you have? Like, yeah, you can think outside the box and like, but like it, focus on like what, with your parameters, where you're at, what you're doing, how can you excel with what, what you have? And I love that mindset, that frame of, you know, of reference. It's true. And, and I mean, like it, no matter whether you work in major league baseball or the NBA or, you know, the premier league in, in England and soccer, like, or, you know, a rugby league in New Zealand, like no matter where you are, there's always going to be teams that are better equipped or have better, like better stuff, more people, like it, it doesn't matter across the board, but that doesn't mean that they can have more of an impact than you can just because they have more resources like that. Again, it's probably something my, my mom and dad taught me way back when, but it's like, you have to, you have to focus on what you can control and focus on what's in front of you and, and what you have at your disposal to make good things happen. And like, you know, what, uh, what did you say earlier? Uh, like all about providing value to, yeah. you know, your, your followers, your fans, like, how can you do that? with the tools that you have at your disposal. And like, again, it's, you know, it doesn't make, I mean, I'm sure it makes the job probably a little bit easier, but it's like, if you have a billion people and all the equipment in the world and everything that you need, like there's still going to be challenges. Like there's totally. still like that team's not going to communicate probably as well as the smaller team. Like yeah. that, that team is probably not going to be able to mobilize and capture something quickly and turn it around, you know, in a way that would benefit social media. So it's like, there's always going to be challenges, but whatever is in front of you, like how can you use that and make that your, your superpower? And how can you take whatever you're doing to kind of achieve that end goal that you have in providing value for, for your followers? And yeah, I can almost guarantee you there, there is a, a social team somewhere that's probably looking at your team thinking, Oh, if we only had the resources they have, you know? And so it's like, it's true. Kind of helps with perspective, but also, like the things that really drive, you know, like the reason that one person teams can start an Instagram and grow up from zero to a million, like they can do that because like what, what really drives growth isn't expensive. It's, it's, it, I mean, it is expensive in the terms of like time and effort and energy, but it's like, you know, community management you know, talking to your audience and your fans, that's free. You don't need a th hundred thousand dollar a year software to do that. You don't need a photographer, a videographer, a copywriter, a graphic designer, you know, you just need like a person who cares about their audience. And so 
I, I, for a long time, I thought community management was a really incredible tool from going from zero to a thousand and maybe even a thousand to 10,000. But I mean, definitely not 10,000 to a hundred thousand is like, that's just content. But seeing brands like C4 Energy is like crushing community management. They're a giant brand. Dude wipes, crushing community management and using that as like, not just like a lever for growth on social, but a lever for sales. I think, uh, I'm think of the, C4's community manager, I think his name's Chandler. Um, Sam Wells is the director over there. And they are just like, they post stuff all the time about like how successful their outbound comments are, looking for opportunities to insert themselves into relevant conversations. And they've seen it time and time again, lead to sales, um, lead to raving fans, lead to audience growth. And like, that doesn't cost anything. Like that's, that's it, it takes time. But I mean, like Gary Vee has been talking about that for you know, since the wine library days, right? Where he would stay up on Twitter until 2 a.m. replying to literally every single person on Twitter that talked about wine and he would insert himself into those conversations. So it's like the fundamentals are still what moves the needle. Yeah, there are a lot of nice to haves that make your life easier. But if you can, um, yeah, if you, if you can meet the needs and like, like I keep coming back to the same thing, add value, you know, that, that's what's really going to move the needle. Yeah. And, and I mean, just like you said, time is kind of that most valuable resource that you have, right? Like Gary V staying up all night, you know, yeah. responding to people, mm -hmm. like, just like you said, it didn't cost him anything but time and like an effort yeah. and being dedicated and wanting it more than anyone else wanted it at that yeah. time. And it's like, and look at the guy, like you still can't open social media for as long as he's been doing it. You can't open any app without him being there with content that fits on that platform that should be there. It's the proper length that has the subtitles. Like yeah. it has everything that you need because he, he gets it like him and his team yeah. get it. They like, there is that fine line of being able to just create amazing stuff that goes everywhere. And it going back to what you were talking about earlier of like your sustainable kind of content funnel of, of what do you have and and how can you repurpose it? But it's like for him, everything that he's doing is being repurposed in so many different yeah. ways and different platforms and different sizes, And it, and it all works because he listens and he get and he experiences yeah. and he gets it. I mean, yeah, and so many people hate on Gary Vee and, you know, whatever, like about him as a person, but like, you, you can't say he doesn't understand the fundamentals of social media growth, you know, like, and I think, you know, you can scroll TikTok long enough, YouTube, Twitter, and you can find these accounts that found these growth hacks where they grew really, really quickly. They, you know, they went from zero to a hundred thousand or even a million on TikTok in 2020, 2021, and now their videos get... 200 300 views right so it's like they, they grew but like at some point along the way and like same thing with youtube and twitter their accounts like it's like social media graveyard of accounts that were massive but then they they failed to keep up with how the not only like the audience was changing but how the platform was changing and so i think yeah that's like if you if you how you get an audience is how you keep an audience so if you grow them with these like gimmicky growth hacks black hat stuff it's like yeah you might get an audience you might make a lot of money but it's like social listening understanding your audience adding value that's like that will like work on every platform every time over the long haul sure algorithms change you know platforms prioritize different stuff but like yeah there's a reason he's always around right it's because he understands the fundamentals yeah and and it's all about like you know we've talked about it for a while now but it's like it's learning it's just like yeah being open and being okay knowing like I don't know everything. I'm never going to know everything, totally. but I know, I know where to look. I know what to research. I know where to kind of listen to learn and understand and know, yeah. you know, Hey, this might be coming or this might be coming, or maybe we should prepare for this just in case this happens. Like there are so many different signs and, and places where you can learn where it's like, the moment you stop learning, like you said, you know, you grow that you find this hack, you grow this account to a million, start making money. And it's like, I'm good. Like, I'm just going to keep doing this. That's the minute the TikTok changes or, totally. you know, Twitter becomes X or, you know, this channel gets, you know, booted off the, the face of the earth. And it's like, now what? And it's like, because you weren't yeah. listening and you didn't see this coming or you didn't think of a way to kind of keep up with the times you're, you're done. And that's all there is to it. Yeah, there's a guy named Chris Kerner on Twitter, and he's probably my one of my favorite Twitter follows. It's MHP underscore guy, which stands for mobile home park guy, because he one of his first businesses like buying uh, and renovating and selling mobile home parks. And so, but he's like an entrepreneur. He's just like got a ton of businesses. He's grown a massive Twitter audience. Uh, I mean, has tons, 
and tons of businesses that he owns, but he was wanting to grow on LinkedIn. And so he was texting me, asking me for advice. And I was just like, my mind was like, dude, like you have got more money than I'll ever have in my entire life. You've got a bigger audience than I could ever dream of having. And he's asking me, like, I don't have a clue what I'm doing, dude. And he's asking me, like, how did you grow on LinkedIn? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? But it's like, you're right. The people that are growing and keeping their following and like, you know, spreading, like, they're the ones that are like, they'll learn from anybody. Like they'll learn from me, <laughs> you know, like I have no idea what I'm doing, but like he was asking me like, and so like, to me, that was just like, so mind blowing. It's like, I know nothing. Like I can learn from literally anybody. And honestly, like you probably have more to learn from some of those people that are like the 20 year old guy that was just creating TikToks of his football team. You know, I don't know, just like stuff like that. So it's like, he probably has an insight into the algorithm that you haven't thought of when you're running a massive brand page. And so, yeah, I totally agree. You can learn, learn from anybody. And you said it, you know, it, it's different, it's different viewpoints, right? Like that dude being this huge entrepreneur made a ton of money, has a lot of different probably business connections and yeah. people similar to him that he's learning from where it's like, you need to think outside the box. And, and again, yeah. like, you know, hyping up this podcast as much as I can, but like <laughs> being able to learn from, you know, content creators all the way up to, you know, VPs of, of their respected organizations or teams or CEOs or authors or whatever it might be. It's like being able to learn from such a varied group of people and, and being able to take from their experiences and, and what they've done and, and how they view things. Like you said, we're, we're all having those same conversations, but it's like, yeah. depending on where you come from or what, you know, what your position is or, you know, what company you work for, it's a little bit different. And I think like the more we can all kind of come together and learn that stuff, the, the better off everyone is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. Well, last thing I want to ask, and, and this is another thing I like to go into is just kind of like, the the process when you come up with this you know whatever the idea might be how do you take that idea from you know in your head to on paper to we are now activating it here are the goals we're trying to achieve and you get it all the way to the finish line and now you know human beings are consuming this on whatever platform you know maybe just take me through a project that you know means a lot to you or or one that that you're really proud of yeah I think it, it differs a little bit when it's just like your personal brand versus a brand account. Because obviously if there's a brand account, there's, there are more layers of like communication, buy-in, pitching, ROI, like that kind of thing. So exclude that, pretend that doesn't exist, just like the the process of like idea to, to execution. I think one thing that like I'm really proud of, not um, anything like I did, but a, a U version, like we were... This was 2020-ish. Um, and TikTok at the time was like girls in their underwear lip singing, right? I mean, it was not like what it is now, like where it's ubiquitous of like, you know, Gen X moms are, you know, living on TikTok. It was very different. And so we were like, man, we're the Bible app. We shouldn't be on, like, and this is me, not you, Virgin, saying this, but like, we're the Bible app. Like, we shouldn't be on TikTok. And I was kind of like pressed on by a few different people who are like, well, like, we're the Bible app, like, shouldn't, isn't that where we should be? You know, of like, if there's like content that's like not helping people, shouldn't we throw in some content that is helping people? And it's like, whoa, like, yeah, we absolutely should be. Um, and so that was really, really um, kind of pushed me to change how, like, how I think about that. And so then we just started creating content. And how can we, again, just going back to the fundamentals of how can we just make our audience how can we make their lives better how can we help them um obviously like we do that through the lens of you know the bible because that was our brand identity and so how can we do that and this was like the golden era of tiktok where you could you posted half decent content you could grow very quickly there wasn't tiktok shop there i mean it wasn't oversaturated and so we grew from like zero to three hundred thousand followers in six months um just by creating you know and people i was like well what do you do i was like well we posted good content multiple times a day every day for six months it's not that I, mean, I wish it was like a simple formula like that now but it was like a lot of times too if you can catch some of those like you know facebook back in like what 20 2009 maybe you know like if you can get in at the right time there's definitely a first mover advantage to some of that but that was um that was something i was really proud of just like how we how i shifted my mindset i was like really like i was thinking 
the wrong way about social is like these platforms aren't good or bad, right? They're morally neutral. It's like, it's how you use them to either add value or detract value from people's lives. It's true. Uh, that That's such a good point, man. Like it, it's, there's so much negativity on any platform you go yeah, on some, prob some more than others, but like, <laughs> But it's mm -hmm. just like you said, going back to that, making an impact and and standing by what your brand believes in or, or the company you're working for and and leaning into that and really bringing it to light, no matter what the platform is, trying to, you know, shine a little light and bring a little positivity to, you know, any stretch of this world is, is definitely yeah. worth worthwhile. Totally. Totally. Well, cool. Well, all right. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. This was so awesome. It was great to finally get a chance to chat for a bit, but yeah, um, I got a, a few quick hitters to, to shut us down and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you free. Cool, man. Love it. Cool. Well, answer these as quickly as slowly, whatever, however you want to answer okay. them, you get like, we can rapid fire them or, you know, you can take a little time and talk about each one, however you want to do it. Um, but first question would be, what's your least favorite industry buzzword? uh, align. Uh, I'm aligned to that or, you know, like that, that drives me bonkers, dude. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, uh, if you could only follow one account on any platform brand or otherwise, what account would that be? I dropped his name earlier, but it's, it's probably Chris Kerner on Twitter. Just cause like he posts these, like his content is like business ideas, but it, it really like, I've noticed like when I consume his content, it shapes like not just like what I'm thinking about, but like how I'm thinking. And so his content is is incredible. I love that. Uh, Parks and Rec or The Office? Uh, the Office. Nice. Uh, what is your favorite Taylor Swift song? Oh, geez. Um, something classic. Uh, love Story. Yeah, let's go Love Story. Nice. I like it. <laughs> uh, friends or Seinfeld? Uh, oh, Friends. Nice. Uh, cool Ranch or Nacho Cheese? Ah, uh, ooh. Okay, so David Novak, who uh, was the CEO of uh, the he was CEO of Yum Brands, but he was also at PepsiCo before that. He went to Mizzou, which is where I went, and he invented or like helped come up with the Cool Ranch flavor. So, uh, gotta go with David Novak, uh, Cool Ranch. I like it. Shout out to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nice. Um, TikTok Reels or Shorts? Shorts. I think shorts are slept on right now, for sure. I think that we talked about like a golden era on TikTok. I think it's hard, it's hard to tell in the moment, but I think we might be in that for YouTube. I love that. Uh, Google Plus or IGTV? Uh, <laughs> uh, Google Plus. Nice. Vine or MySpace? Dude, these questions are awesome. I love these. Uh, uh, I'm a little young for MySpace. I think it was like it was leaving when I was coming up. So, uh, but Vine was big. So I'll go with Vine. Yeah. It, MySpace was like the first of uh, like what I remember, but like there was nothing like Vine. Like that, it just yeah. like that was, that was TikTok before TikTok. And it was yeah, like, you, yeah, you could absolutely. just spend hours on there. I love that platform. It, it was like almost before it's time, you know, it's like, yeah. that's like it was a little early, but it's, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Uh, all right. And last one would be uh, rate the finale of Game of Thrones one to 10. I I have never seen a single oh, episode man. of Game of Thrones. I did. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll go five. I don't know. I, honestly, I think that's that's a pretty fair rating. I think that's pretty solid. Okay, cool. but honestly, it, it's crazy. Like this global phenomenon and I caught on to Game of Thrones late. Like I think I watched maybe the last two seasons live with like the rest of the world, but like it's one of those things where like the office is a similar thing where it's like, yeah. you assume that every social person at works because yeah. like, there's always game of Thrones. Like when that show was on, there was so much on social at oh, all totally. times. And so it's funny. I would say out of kind of like, I think the 15 conversations I've had so far, there's probably eight to 10 uh, who have never seen game really? of Thrones. And it's like, it just blowing my mind. It's, it's amazing. I was on a date with my wife at Gumby's Pizza in Columbia, Missouri, when the Game of Thrones finale was on. And so there were people, apparently Gumby's Pizza was a hot spot to watch Game of Thrones, but there were a ton of people in there watching it. And I think we were probably the only people in there that like, like what is going on? And so <laughs> I, I saw it on in the background, but I, yeah, I can't say I've, I've ever paid any attention to it. 
No, that's good. I, I think five. I think five's fair. I think that's a fair. All right, all right sweet. <laughs> well, cool. Well, honestly, I I can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, you know, any chance I get to to pick your brain, I'm I'm I promise I'm going to do so. But, um, I, I again, I can't thank you enough. Yeah, this was incredible. I had so much fun. This was a this was a blast, dude. Appreciate it. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, it's another episode of a very good social media podcast where we try to live up to that name every day, and we will see you again soon. Thank you.